When you hear the term PI, private investigator, do you envision some guy sitting in a parked car for hours on end, watching through windows, going through alleyways, getting into people's private lives? They do that. And sometimes they even write about it. And sometimes they write a whole series of books about it. My name is Vin DeQuino, and our next guest was a PI for a long time, and his name is Frank Hickey. Frank, let's talk writing. Let's talk writing. Yeah, All let's right. do it. Let's do it. Whoa, so you went from parked cars and investigating and getting into people's lives to writing about it. Tell me a little bit of who is Frank Hickey. I found the magazine that made me want to become a writer in a garbage can oh. when I was 10 years old. It was a smelly copy of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Oh. And I speared it out of the garbage can, took it home, read it, and one story in there said, you should be a writer. Oh, it spoke man. that way to me. Wow. See, that, I mean, people don't believe it when I tell them that there is a moment, that inspirational moment that grabs you and haunts you the rest of your life. And you have been haunted by writing. You've done some wonderful books. And so at a very early age, you said, I want to write mystery books. And you did that even before you became a PI. Correct. Yep, I wow. did. Wow. So do you think that also inspired you to be a PI? Yes, I think very much so. I wanted, it always interested me. So I didn't know if the cart came before the horse or the cart was riding on top of the horse. It all came together, and I started writing when I was about 10 or 11 years old. Wow. And, and this idea of becoming a private investigator, uh, you opened up a business, or you, you, how did you actually do it? Did you work for somebody first or something? Uh, what I did to begin was I opened up the yellow pages, went down the list of private investigators. Wow. At that time, New York had a lot of very colorful characters. Oh, yeah, they still do. <laughs> Fewer. Some working out of their hats. Yeah. Some working out of their mother-in-law's garages. <laughs> and very interesting people. Mm. And in a week or so, I found a job in the World Trade Center on the 88th floor Whoa. doing private investigation work, doing mostly def criminal defense work. Wow. And I had absolutely no idea what to do. I had no training. I didn't even know how to drive a car. <laughs> oh, wow. I wore thick glasses. And all I had was the, the fire to learn and some foreign languages. Wow. And I was guided by the novels of Ross MacDonald, his Lou Archer series. Wow. I said, well, okay, this is low tech <laughs> yeah. and it's very humanistic. Yeah. So let me see if I can do this. Wow. Now, at that time, were we into computers yet, or were we typing it out, doing the Ernest Hemingway style? I was definitely typing it out. Yeah, me I too. I thought typewriters were high tech at that time. Yeah. <laughs> when they invented the Selectric typewriter, I was like, oh my God, you could write in like three different fonts. And that, at that time, was like, holy cow, even italics, you know, that was big time. And the Selectric barely touched it. I mean, I, I started with these manual typewriters where you, by the time I was done, my arms hurt. Uh, but, so you went from the typewriter, uh, also painstaking because when you need to make changes, you, you back to the white out and have to retype the page. Uh, so you, your first stories were on a typewriter. Absolutely. They are, actually, they were on notebooks first. No, yeah. I didn't wow. come to typewriters for a while because, once again, you had to go home. And I liked being out in the park <laughs> or being yeah. on the beach yeah. and writing in a pocket notebook, which I still do. Yeah. And people stare at you in the New York City subway. Oh, yeah. You're writing something in a little are book. you writing about me? You're writing something <laughs> in a little book with a ballpoint pen. Yeah, Nobody like, does that. Yeah, they don't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, kids today don't even know what a ballpoint pen is. When I, when I mention to my grandson, grab me a ballpoint pen, and he says, oh, what? <laughs> you know, they, they don't even know what ballpoint means. No. I used to write. I went to a Catholic school, and we wrote with fountain pens. 
and unfortunately, I'm left-handed. When left hander is right, the palm of your hand goes right across the wet ink after you write. And I'd go home with ink all down the side of my hand, all down the front of my shirt, my pants. The desk had marks from my hand all over it. So it's, we've come a long way since. It's a so right-handed world. It is a right-handed world. And uh, so eventually you went to laptop? Very eventually. Very I, stayed eventually. On, I stayed on typewriters and word processors wow. for a long time. Yeah. I remember we used to have the pet computers with the little floppy disks that you put in that you could destroy in about two seconds. Uh, yeah, it took a long time. And I went through that evolution. I'm sure you did too. One step at a time till you finally get to it. So at what point did you start really seriously getting into the publishing end of of writing books? The publishing end, I would say very recently, within the past three years or so. Oh, wow. That's when they, they All started these? coming out. Yes, sir. Wow. Busy boy. Uh, but I had, as we spoke about before, unpublished manuscripts going back to the 70s. Yeah, we all too. have that stuff Yeah, in our, that's right. In our I've trunk. got them in boxes. <laughs> Some of these books that I have here were written back in the 70s, mm -hmm. and I put them away. Right. And I knew, like, for instance, Return of the Cicada was about AIDS mm -hmm. in the late 70s. Well, people didn't talk about AIDS, and you no. know, they tried to avoid it in every way. I couldn't get a publisher to even hear the word AIDS, and it wasn't until last year that I put out Return of the Cicada. So th I urge writers, don't throw anything away. Don't ever throw anything away. No, get not your, at all. Get it, store it. Now it's a lot easier. You can store in a computer. But I have boxes and boxes of handwritten manuscripts and manuscripts with typewriter that I had to do over and over and over again. And I didn't know how to type. I still am the world's fastest haunt and pecker in the world. So. Actually, my first book, The Gypsy Twist, was written... 20 plus years ago. It's a story of a serial killer hunt. Wow. And at the time that I wrote it, I was a police officer and I was hunting a real life serial killer. Wow. Here in New York. Wow. And so not all of these have been written recently. Wow. And this was recently revised. Yeah. But the other stories go back a long time where I would pick it up and say, no, this isn't working right now. And then I would pick it up at a later date and say, we have our second wind, we have renewed energy here, and we can tackle this book now. Do you have instances where you're writing along and then you're kind of like stuck, and then you just say, I'll put this away for now, I'll come back to it later? Or do you finish the book one way or another? I finish the book because I really admire the writers, mostly of bygone eras, who were able to do a high output, high volume, such as Charles Dickens. Yes. And Dickens lived to be only 58 years old. Yeah, wow. And look at what he gave us. Oh, my God. And Volumes. I think we're so grateful that he didn't put it aside because you never know when you, if you're going yeah, to wake up the next day. have never gotten to the end of it. Especially in my line of work, I always figured uh, I would leave instructions what should be done with this manuscript wow. if something unhappy happens to me. Wow. Wow, that's, that's scary. I mean, it's a scary business. Uh, do you take little snippets from real-life situations for your books? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. But change the name to Protect the Innocent. Change the name to Protect the Innocent. I remember the first time I had to spray a client. I call the criminal's clients in real life. He was on PCP, and both my associate and I, we were uniformed officers, we sprayed him with PCP, and he opined to us loudly, that's nothing but blankety-blank aftershave. Oh. And as the three of us went to the ground, I said to myself, if I get through this, that's going in the book. Yeah, you that's go. That's going in the book. Yeah. Uh, th there are many instances that are in my books that really happen. I mean, one of my favorite ones is in Kiss the Candy Days Goodbye, when I was a young kid, we had a summer house without electricity. So we had outhouses. And in the middle of the night, if you had to go, you either went in a little pot by the side of the bed or you went to the outhouse. 
And one time I did go to the outhouse, and my brother decided that he was going to scare me. So I didn't know what was going on. What he didn't know is that I brought a hatchet with me. And I'm walking with the hatchet. He jumps out of the thing. I swung, missed him by like that much. So that's in the book where uh, I put the scene in. It wasn't me in the book, but the scene was still there, you know, and we do that. We borrow from oh, our yes, lives. Oh, yes, absolutely. And being a PI is, as far as I'm concerned, wonderful for this kind of writing because I often meet writers who try to write murder mysteries and know nothing about murder mysteries. They're police do things that police don't do, that Very you just true. can't do. And I understand that it doesn't always have to be 100% realistic, but it has to be somewhat realistic. You have to believe in the story that you're reading. So do you find yourself sometimes locked in to what really has to happen, or do you kind of bend a little bit here and there? I can bend it with no qualms whatsoever because a lot of our cases aren't black and white. They are not black and white. They are not linear. Yep. They do things that are completely unexpected. They're broken sometimes by a chance remark. Somebody remembers something. Somebody has a change of heart sometimes on their deathbed. And the case cracks wide open. Yeah. And the detectives, and I admire the detectives in my books and in real life who can do this, and there are hundreds of them, they keep these cases in their heads. No computers, yeah, no wow. notebooks. Wow. They can remember this, and when a group of them get together to pool information, they are unstoppable. Wow. So in your books, do you have the same main character for every book? Yes, I do. Wow. So is that a detective? He is a lighthearted former New York City policeman and I was never a New York City police uh. PD officer. He served less than two indistinguished years, mostly dotted by suspensions and days off, <laughs> and was thrown off the department for mental illness or oh, disease. Wow. <laughs> Nevertheless, he's often very cheerful. He's a ballroom dancer, as I am. He calls himself a bon vivant, a raconteur, and a student of the cocktail. <laughs> and he manages to live uh, by hand to mouth in a wealthy neighborhood, on the fringe of a wealthy neighborhood in Manhattan, and marveling at the city all around him and at the world all around him. So they're not dark books. They're not grim books. Right. He's a happy camper. Wow. Now, you are a Flatbusher. Originally from Flatbush, yes. Originally from Flatbush. You borrow from that time? Well, the most recent book is called Softening Flatbush. Oh, there you go. And that takes place in the here and now. But Flatbush was my cradle. That's where I grew up before my family moved to Manhattan. And to me, it was a magical place, much like the childhood village of Marquez, the Colombian writer who wrote 100 Years of Solitude, where he felt anything was possible. Yeah. The world could spin on the axis right in Flatbush. It was a wonderful, safe, elastic, fantastic, storytelling neighborhood. And I try to recreate that in the most recent book. So you borrow from the neighborhoods of Flatbush? And every neighborhood that I've worked in. Right. I lived from in different Manhattan places. Too. Manhattan, Los Angeles, where I lived in Chinatown when I was wow. in the police department there. And each neighborhood, especially in New York City, is So very you were different. in the police department in more than just New York City? I was never a New York City police officer. Right. I was a district attorney's investigator, which is a police officer. Wow. But I was in the Savannah, Georgia Police Department. Wow. Made corporal there after four years and later joined the Los Angeles Police Department. And you did Europe for a while. Yes, I did. And tell me about the European experience. It was similar to here? I mean, you even did Sicily. I did Sicily. I oh, lived in oh, Sicily. The flat bush of Italy. <laughs> I lived in Sicily. I worked in Sicily in a town of 35 people uh, 40 years ago when it was a very traditional place where the road actually ended in this town. Wow. And I stayed there for months. Wow. Living in a cave on the beach. Oh, my God. Well, it didn't take a lot of brains when the Scirocco storm hit. Yeah. You needed shelter. 
Yeah. And the villagers had lived in this cave during World War II <coughs> and during the earthquake of 67. And they brought me to the cave. What brought you to Sicily at all? I was cold in northern Italy. It was wintertime. Wow. And I was very curious about Sicily, having read the Godfather book, which you mentioned before. Yeah. And I ran into very few Americans ever in Sicily. Very few Americans visited even now. Yeah, yeah. But it was a fascinating place. A little place. scary. <laughs> I never had any difficulty. Wow. And once wow. again, I was very nearsighted, fumbling my way across. Uh, not a fighter, a romantic yeah. dreamer. But there's, there's a key. When I first moved from upstate to closer to New York City, I asked a friend of mine how to survive in New York City. He said, it's easy. Try to look more like the mugger than the muggy. <laughs> <laughs> he says, make them be afraid of you instead of you afraid of them. I said, I get it. That, <laughs> that might explain my wardrobe. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so do you borrow from your European days? Not that much. I wrote a book about the European life. Oh. I found two things happen when you write about your young and carefree days in Europe. <laughs> yeah. The first thing is the audience doesn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. And the second thing is that they're jealous. Yeah. Now, they shouldn't be jealous. There were heavy rainstorms, big watchdogs, yes. nasty policemen. Scary moments. <laughs> right, scary yeah. moments. When you couldn't see the road in front of you, wow. literally. Wow. And big trucks in back of you. Nevertheless, to a reader, that seems like, I, he had a great life over there. I'm jealous. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> when the hero is not in trouble. <laughs> well, sometimes the hero has to be in trouble, as we know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, one thing about writing a series, I say that is the epitome of being a haunted writer because your character doesn't want to go away. You finish the book and you say, I'm done. And the character says, hello, I'm still here. I have another story to tell. And you just keep going. Uh, this main character is a living human being for you. He's a person who has character. He has three dimensions. He knows what to do. If I ask you any question about that character, I would bet you can answer it because he's a real person in your mind. That's right. And I'm happy to be haunted by him. <laughs> yeah. It's not an unhappy yeah. occupation. Yeah. I, I, I tell writers, don't write a character. Give birth to one. It's got to be someone who breathes and lives. Someone that, if I say to you, would he shoot his best friend? You can answer that, can't you? Yes. Would he take risks? <laughs> Piece of cake. Of course he would. What things would he not do? You can answer it because he's real to you. So he's done a number of things. Has he done anything that even surprised you? Yes. There are times when, like me, he is not a daredevil. <laughs> yeah. And I know people who are daredevils. I've known them in civilian life, in my own family. I've known them when I worked with them. And I could tell the difference between them and me. But you've put your life on the line, and so has he. Have you ever put your life on the line? Yes. Yeah. Reluctantly. So that's not a daredevil. There is a right. difference. It's not a daredevil. Reluctantly. Absolutely. Reluctantly. <laughs> you do it because you have to do it, not because you're willing to face. You're not going to jump over the canyon in a motorcycle. Not more than once. <laughs> not no. more than once. Not and not trying. unless you're being chased. Right. <laughs> uh, makes sense. So this character has some real qualities. He's a real person. And somewhat based on your own experience. Well, he's not a tough guy. Is he? Oh, okay. So that's Just like me. Enough. When he's searching a client, he will say what I used to say, which is, no need for anyone to get hurt here, my friend. <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> I, only, I only took this job to meet girls. <laughs> and I've been asked that question in court. Officer yeah. Hickey, did you say that to my client? <laughs> I said, yes, Your Honor. It sounds like something I would say. <laughs> yeah, you know. And, you know... I, I understand that, and there is a distinct character. And people say, do you borrow from yourself when you write? And I say, 
always. Even the mother in Kiss the Candy Days Goodbye is modeled after my mother. And the things that she does in the book are things that I would do. If she sat by the kid's side all night long, I did that for my son when he had pneumonia. And I find myself in that book, I am the coach, I am the mother, I am the father, I am the kid, I am the kid's best friend. Because we put ourselves into our characters and we borrow from our own lives. And if we can identify with this character, we don't have to be the character. It doesn't mean that everything the character does, you would do. But you understand why that character does what he does, when he does it. And also, if you're writing a book as thoroughly as you can, you're understanding why every character does what he does. That's right. Or she does. That's right. It's, you, you've heard me say that the hardest part of being a book, of, of being an author, is be on both sides of every kiss. Yes. You also have to be on both sides of every gun. You have to be the one holding it, and you have to be the one it's pointing to. And you have to know what that is, what it feels like to have a gun pointed at you, and to know that at any minute, someone can press that trigger, and it's over. Or be in a situation where you don't want to shoot anyone, but you have to if you have to. And you have to know that. You also have to know the consequences of what would happen if you did. And you've been there, so you do know that. Yes. Uh, so do you find yourselves wrapped up in your book sometimes? What do you mean like when you say wrapped Like where up? you're writing and you're like, oh my God, and you're just as shocked as the reader is going to be when, when the story unfolds. Oh, yes. Unusual things come out. Yeah, yeah. That's the best I, way I to put it. I found myself crying a couple times. <laughs> what a great scene. In, the, in this, uh, uh, I forget which book it was, where the, the boy's dog, after all the years, his dog dies, and he's on the bed, and he's got the dog's body in his arms, and he's crying because he... He he knew he wasn't there when the dog died, and he always promised himself and the dog that when that moment came, he'd be there, but he wasn't. And I'm sitting there, and tears are coming down my face because, I mean, I, I feel the kid's pain. So do you get involved and tied up in these stories enough so that you even surprise yourself? Oh, yes. Scenes? And there are times when you, I do most of my writing on my iPhone. Oh, really? I like the open air. Wow. And I will do this on a subway platform station, elevated is better, or on a park bench. And sometimes those emotions do get to you. Yeah. They do take you over. And I am here to report that in New York City, when you start crying on the subway... You could be in trouble. <laughs> well, you usually get a lot of room on either side. <laughs> yeah. Even in rush hour, yeah. people say, Le leave him alone. Yeah, he, yeah. the poor guy. Yeah. We, we don't know yeah. what it is. We, we don't want it to become <laughs> our problem. It right? <laughs> It'll give you some living room right there <laughs> where nothing else will. Well, that's funny. Uh, writer's block. Problem? Not yet. Once again, yeah. I admire people who say the show must go on. Yep. I think writers and people in general do very well when they're pressed, when they have to do something, when they say to themselves, I have to finish this book, I have to finish this story. Yeah. I made friends with a writer, Michael Abalone, who had finished, published more than 100 books, Wow. the Man from Uncle series among them. Wow. And when I met him, I quoted some lines from his book to him. I hadn't read the book in 25 years. He said, Frank, you know something unusual about that book? I wrote it in a day. Wow. He was known wow. as having the fastest typewriter in the East. Wow. <laughs> and when you think of how many days you throw away doing not much of anything. I, I know. To have but started and finished days, a book. Aren't there days that you need that? Days when you just stop writing and you just kind of like don't write at all and you just kind of need headroom, head time? No. No? No. I do. I Maybe do. I need them, but I'm not, I'm but not giving in to that. Yeah, Wow. Well, how do you know when a book is finished? It's the time when you're happy with it, yep. when you know that you've done the best you can with it, you know that nothing further can be done, you've taken it, the funny scenes, and a lot of the books in my, in my series I think are very lighthearted. They're not yeah. grim and gray at all any more than I am. And you know that it's as funny and as touching 
and as poignant and as frightening as you can make it. All right, so here's a, here, here's a big question for you. He's been living through all of these books. Is he going to die anytime soon? Or do I we have more books in the uh, series? We have more books. We have more books coming out. More books are coming out. Absolutely. So you're, you're going to keep these series going. Absolutely. And they're called a Max Royster Mystery. The Max Royster Crime Novels. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And you're going to keep writing them, and he's going to keep living for a while. Yes, he will. Well, we're glad to hear that. <laughs> and we're also glad that you came here today to share all this with us. Uh, I wish we had another 28 minutes. Uh, I wish we had another hour and 28 minutes. I could talk to you all day. We never even mentioned the fact that you wrote a movie. With two other, with two other screenwriters. With two other screenwriters. Been out for but a couple of years. Frank, keep on writing. Keep on doing what you're doing. We love what you do. Uh, I can't wait. I want to read every book in the series. Uh, this is the kind of thing You have like. my permission. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a pleasure to have you here. A pleasure to have you here. You have had the opportunity to meet Frank, now meet his books, read his books, and stay tuned to this show for even more authors. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here today. At this time, the credit.